This is Dominion from Two Loose Grooves. I'm listening to Barbecue Central. Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Welcome to the Really Big Barbecue Central Show. This is the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. Originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I am your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evening's live fire. Say it with me. Fun and frivolous the show. If you want to jump in this evening with a phone call or email, here's how you do it. You can get in touch with the show by calling 216-220-0966. Email Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. On the Twitter and Instagram, said BBQ Central Show. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, the BBQ Central Show.com. And here's what's happening in case you didn't get the newsletter, which you can sign up for over at the main website as well if you haven't done that. In about 12 minutes from now, where you would typically find third Tuesday of the month regular guest Stephen Reichlin, Barbecue Hall of Famer, author extraordinaire, live fire cook like no other, cooking cool, uh, cooking school class instructor, and the list goes on. I have asked Stephen with, of course, peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love. Stephen, can I please have the segment and let me have it back? So I can invite somebody else on this time around because it's a pertinent competition follow-up segment. We all know that Memphis and May went off last weekend, this past weekend. And joining me, none other than Lord of Q and now tied with Big Bob Gibson on overall world titles at Memphis and May. Myron Mixon will be rejoining the show, believe it or not. We got a segment with Myron. Looking forward to catching up with him and hearing about the weekend. 35 past the hour. We have a newcomer as well. You love fast food? Of course you do. A lot of you are fat. Love fast food. Mix it in where you can otherwise. How about a fast food reviewing expert? None other than the likes of Bill Oakley joining the show. That's right. Bill Oakley will be here. And we'll learn about Bill's background and then, of course, talk about how he ventured off into the fast food reviewing genre. You will find him, I think, exclusively on Instagram. If you do any type of Googling of Bill Oakley, you will find that he has quite perhaps one of the most accomplished pasts or backgrounds you have ever seen on the show, believe it or not. Emmy Award winner, writer for The Simpsons, lots of TV. The list goes on. Harvard educated lampoon as well. Come on. Unbelievable. And we'll have him right here on the show talking about fast food. Why not? Second hour, we'll find new quarterly guest making her first appearance, although it could be her second quarterly appearance. We missed her the first time around as we get through quarters here in 2021. The creator of Hey Grill Hey, TV star, products. Developer extraordinaire, recipe developer extraordinaire, Susie Bullock will join us. And Susie went to Memphis in May this past weekend, so we'll get her reaction as more of a spectator slash walker around her, although she did partner up with the team and take part in some portion of competition. So we'll get all the Memphis in May feedback. We'll also talk to Susie about getting a product to market and what all that entails. I know we've been doing that with Meathead from AmazingRibs.com, but... It would be good to get a different perspective here of somebody who is 
been well established in the market and how you go about bringing those products in, what sells, what doesn't, how do you find a co-packer, how do you ask those right questions and vetting and all the fun stuff. So if you're thinking about bringing something to market here in 2021, it's a competition or it's a conversation that you will want to take on as well. And then depending on where we end with Susie, I'll hold the open segment towards the back. Of course, we have yet another passage to be found in what I refer to as the reference guide to horse meat consumption for humans. And I have one picked out or the next one picked out ready to share with you should time a lot. So that's what's happening. Myron Mixon and Bill Oakley in the first hour, Susie Bullock in the second hour, perhaps another passage in the reference material of horse meat to close out the show. Don't forget, you can follow me socially, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Snapchat at BBQ Central Show. For a live video feed of this show, you can go to the following areas, Facebook and Twitch slash BBQ Central Show. Also one on YouTube slash RD Rempe. I want to give you a little internet reaction to something that should have never been reacted to, and it was easily one of the most reacted to things ever. And whoever put it out, TripAdvisor or whoever it was, put out a list somewhere last week revealing who they were picking as the top barbecue restaurants in the area. Uh, I'm sorry, not only in the area, but in the country. So I don't want to get all hot and bothered about this because the minute I saw it, it signified clickbait or let's get drive traffic to the website. I think it was TripAdvisor. It had such booming barbecue metropolises as sitting in the number one position and whom we all wildly associate with barbecue as New Orleans. Sixth on the list. Sixth on the list was none other than the capital city of Ohio, Columbus. I have been to Columbus any number of times already this year. I have been around plenty of people talking about food and where to go to eat. Not once did barbecue come up in the conversation. Not once. A little bit of a smattering of talk about Jeff Ruby's, further smatterings about Hyde Park. They got a lot of okay chains down there if you're into that kind of a thing. You can go to North Market, talk about North Market. Never did anybody mention barbecue in relation to Columbus, Ohio. And there were plenty of other locations across the nations. So don't worry. Don't fall for it. What's rule number two of the show? Don't get hooked. And plenty of you got hooked. New Orleans actually released an article yesterday saying that they know that they aren't the number one city for barbecue in the country. They didn't have to say that. Everybody knows it. Remember, don't get hooked is almost rule number one of the show. And if we weren't allowed to mention names on the show, it would usurp and jump to number one. Don't get hooked. Don't just click because. Don't get all hot and bothered because you see the likes of Columbus and New Orleans. Seattle on the list. Realize what's happening. Just driving traffic. Also, I got plenty of emails over the week asking me about the songs Meathead referenced at the beginning of our segment last week. First and foremost, I will not. Andrew, you are not. The I am not going to be playing those on the show ever. Those were actually bits that I wrote and produced for another internet talk show many, many years ago. They have nothing to do with the show. They were, of course, hilarious and raunchy, and I will never feature them on the show. Never. I won't even send them to you if you ask me in a private email. They're disgusting. They were funny because they were show-related about the show I was listening to and writing for. But outside of that, I would never 
let anybody listen to those. They're horrid in a very funny way. Listener feedback from a couple weeks ago as we set up for round two of American Idol next week. Greg, happy to see and hear the second season of American Idol Barbecue Central Show Edition is back at it. All five of you have what? Big balls. I would not want to be judged by your kids, Greg. They are ruthless. Do they know that you keep a roof over their heads? Ladies, lighten up. Lucky in Georgia, let me tell you something. Those ladies know exactly what they're doing. I've given them a task to judge, and they are making no bones about it. They are judging as harshly as it gets. So if you like American Idol Season 2, you got into it last month, Round 2 is coming next week. Before we get to Myron, let me talk to you quickly about Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue, a curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies. We'll get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything at Big Papa Smokers has been hand-picked and approved by Sterling Big Papa Ball himself. So they have the championship rubs and seasonings, of course, popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, Double Secret Steak. Regular money, the list goes on. They also own Granny's Barbecue Sauce. So if you're looking for a new go-to sauce that's easy to use and will please everybody, you might want to give Granny's a try, especially if you're sick and tired of what's existing out there on the market today. Good by itself, good as a base sauce that you can tweak, up to you. And aside from the premium selection of rubs and sauces, they also offer grills and smokers. Maybe you're looking for a versatile cooker that's easy to use. Check out that Mac 2-Star General Pellet Cooker, Big Papa Smokers, the exclusive Mac dealer, even offering special packages. Not a fan of pellet smokers? All right. Take a look at that old Hickory Ace BP, the only charcoal smoker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trailer. If you're not a backyard barbecue enthusiast, you can peruse the website and then ask questions about ones that you think might work for you, 877-828-0727, or shop their website at BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers.com. We are back with Myron Mixon to recap the big win over at Memphis in May this past weekend. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by the Barbecue Guru, creators of automatic pit temperature control technology, sellers of ceramic cookers with built-in power draft fans already there. Other accessories to make your barbecue and grilling life easier, visit them online at bbqguru.com or call them at 800-288-GURU. The Barbecue Guru continues to be a breakthrough in barbecue technology. All right, my first guest this evening, Bill, is the winningest man in barbecue. Penned a number of successful books. We'll talk about one of those here this evening after we get through the competition talk. He has taught hundreds, if not thousands at this point, of people how to cook better barbecue at his classes. You've seen him on TV. The list that goes on. We race to the hotline. And excitedly, welcome back, guest of the show, Myron Mixon. Hey, Myron. How you doing, brother? I am absolutely fabulous, Myron. Appreciate you making time for the show here. First and foremost, of course, we wish you congratulations on the big win this past weekend at Memphis in May. But I think there's quite a bit to unpack as we look back over the course of the weekend. Uh, First of which is... There was no Memphis in May last year, so this is the first time back at it as uh, 2021 starts to roll around. People are a little bit unsure of what the competition landscape is going to look like. Uh, me and my embedded correspondents actually bet against uh, Memphis in May actually happening this year, but of course we were proven wrong, thank goodness. It looked a little different than it has in years past when it's traditionally taken as Memphis in May play. So just from a high level, what were your thoughts about the competition actually coming off, and how did it look and feel to you versus some of those other years? 
Well, I mean, because we didn't have it last year, <clears throat> I didn't realize. I've been going there since 1996, and I didn't realize how much I actually missed it. Last year, everybody was all up in there, uh, restaurants closed and shutting down. I mean, I was shut down for a little while in Alexandria. Uh, you were just proud to get through the year. But as 2021 came on, you didn't realize how much you missed the championship missed going to Memphis. And as February rolled, you know, uh, March, getting closer, you know, we were really excited about making it, but we were really anticipating getting that call, getting that email, saying we're going to have to postpone it again. But uh, it was, I didn't realize how much I did miss it. I really didn't. Again, I've been going since 96, not saying it's old hat, but, um, you know, you see a lot of your same friends up, up there, and that's one of the big things about it. But it, I'm not going to say it got monotonous, but it was the same routine. It had been going the same way for so long, we took it for granted. And when it didn't happen, that's when you realized uh, we missed it. But with that being said, we get there, uh, don't have as many teams, of course, because they're separating and spreading. And plus you have uh, the city of Memphis – doing some big expansion in the park that limited the size of the contest. But also it was limited in the fact they couldn't sell but X amount of tickets mm -hmm. to stay in compliance with Shelby County, which is the county Memphis is in, and the city of Memphis's uh, COVID restrictions. So, you know, instead of having 100,000 people walking all the way through the park, you had 10,000 total. That included team members teams, volunteers, uh, you know, EMS, police protection, you know, that included them. So you could probably put a number of probably maybe 3,000 actual ticket purchasers coming through the gates, and all of them had to be bought online. You couldn't buy a ticket at the gate. All tickets had to be bought online. So it looks and feels different. You know, I wonder as a competitor – in some way, do you appreciate this format more because you're certainly one of the more high-profile teams for any number of reasons? A lot of people see you on TV. They want to get a piece of Myron. They want to be around the camp. You don't have that many people walking around and milling about. Does it make it an easier competition for you as far as executing the plan? I'm not going to say it doesn't make it easier. Of course it does. I mean, you're not in any way distracted, and you don't have any – uh, you can stay focused on the comp. With that being said, I still miss seeing the fans. I miss seeing barbecue fans, people that plan on coming there, plan on seeing all the, the folks they've watched on TV, plan on seeing all the folks that sit around the circuit during the year. And, uh, you know, balancing it out, I just soon had all the folks there. I mean, that's what barbecue's about. I mean, that's what made the – you can call it a sport, and it is a sport. It's what made competition barbecue what it is. You know, competition barbecue wouldn't be where it is if we all went out in the middle of a cow field or a corn uh, patch and just cooked by ourselves, just teams only. You got to have spectators. You got to have people watching. You got to have enthusiasts that make this what it is today. The teams ain't what makes this. I mean, we can all get out here in my backyard in my compound and then we can all cook, but nobody's going to know about it. The notoriety, people picking their favorites, going around sampling barbecue going across the country with all that. The fans make the contest. It's not the you know contestants. Byron, when you look at the actual competition itself, when I talk to the pitmasters on the show, everybody's preaching consistency and running the same program, blah, blah, blah. I would assume at Memphis it's a similar mindset. It's a little bit different competition than some of the stuff that we would talk about on this show because it's its own deal, its own judging and so forth. Certainly you're used to all of that. You did two things going into this ja or I'm sorry into this uh, competition that I didn't anticipate that you would do one you switch cookers and two you switched mm -hmm. injections so I'm wondering Correct. were you just throwing it up against the wall because this is the first one back since pandemic and let's see what happens or was there a lot more practice and effort into making those decisions well there was a lot more practice uh, since 1996 when I first started competing I've always cooked on water cookers and our brand of Myra Mix and Smokers, we call them H2Os. 
And, you know, that's the element symbol for water. And I've always cooked with water pans, always. And uh, never have I ever been to Memphis May and not cook on water cookers. With that being said, we started and we built a gravity, and we've been building gravity, uh, charcoal smokers, but we built a bra- uh, gravity hot cooker. And I've been playing with this thing now going on probably nine months. I have the original prototype here at the compound. I always wind up with the prototypes to, to work out any kinks. And we've been using them at our cook schools. And I do a cook school a month, so I get to do a hog a month. On top of that, I've been cooking practice hogs, and I have never in my life cooked practice hogs for any contest or any. When I was running for team with UMM May back in the day, I was doing 45 contests a, a year. I never cooked a practice hog on anything. But I started seeing the kind of hogs I was turning out at cook school without them being wrapped. Had to cook at a lower temp, around 225, 235. You know where I could cook on the water cookers at 250, 275, even 300. If I got behind, it could take it because of the water and the steam. But I was getting these gorgeous hogs without having to wrap these hogs. But also in Memphis and May, there's another element. Really and truly, you're not supposed to have water hook up at Memphis and May. They don't give you water. They give you spigots throughout the park where you're supposed to go and fill up uh, buckets, jugs, whatever, for your use. And a lot of times everybody can get a hose hooked on and, you know, you don't have water for a period of time. But there's always a stress uh, factor in there. If you're running water cookers, that you're going to run out of water. And I said, I'm not going to go through all of that. And another factor was having to tote wood, get wood. If it rains, you got to keep wood dry. And with these gravities, I started getting great results using lump charcoal mixed with some wood chunks. And I didn't have to fool with the wood. I didn't have to fool with the water. The only thing I had to make sure was I had electricity to run the gurus. And that's what we did this year. (laughs) But the element you don't know, you may know, I took two brand new, uh, our 72XC gravity hog smokers, and I set them on the trailer, never cooked on them until we got to the championship when we put the hogs on. Never been cooked on. Now, with that being said, they're identical to the prototype I've been practicing on, but these had never had any fire in them. Never been heated up. Is that a big risk, do you think? It's not as big a risk as people try to make out. Um, really and truly about the, the you need to burn off and all this kind of stuff. That came in the day where people were using steel cylinders. Uh, A lot of times steel comes with oil in them. Some of the metals that come with a fine film of oil on them to keep them from rusting, you know, and and you need to uh, burn that off. That's what you're burning off inside of a smoker that's a lot of times was hand built. But all these, you know, that metal is not like that when using uh, chrome poly racks didn't have that kind of issue. But I will tell you this, I sat down there with these hogs with my guys until about 3 a.m. before I went to the room to get some rest from 10 p.m. Friday night to about 8 a.m. Uh, Saturday morning, the park was without water. Somebody had run over one of the spigots, so the park was without water, shut it all down. So we made the right call and not cooking with the water cookers this time. What about the injection? What did you find that needed to be changed or were you, did you just think there needed to be change for change? Uh, we changed, I guess you could say change for change, but we changed some of the flavor profiles in it in the form of the juices. Uh, my injection can, contains apple juice and also it's got some peach in it. And uh, we added some other flavors uh, of juices in there with it to uh, balance it. Made a big difference. Made a real big difference. So obviously this win pulls you in a tie now with Big Bob Gibson's for overall Memphis and May wins. Chris was separated there for a number of years, but uh, he caught up to him this past weekend. So I'm wondering where this win ranks, considering everything that's happened over the last 16 months, if this makes a Memphis and May win 
a little bit sweeter than some of the ones in the past. Certainly, a Memphis and May win is as good the first time as it is the 51st time, I'm sure. But I'm wondering if this one sets apart in a certain way because of everything that's happened. Well, of course. I mean, getting the fifth one, that's awesome. I mean, that's a feat that I never dreamed would happen. You know, I always wanted to get one. And I got the first one in 2001. Um, the one that's special about this, the last time we won it was in 2016. And there was a few of my black shirts, I, my teammates call them black shirts because that's what we wear, that uh, they couldn't make it back then. I had two or three. They're tremendous uh, teammates. They go all the time. They hear my cook schools. They help with the classes. But for whatever reason, they wasn't there in 16. Well, those guys were there this time, and that really what made it special. <laughs> they uh, they got the rings in sixteen, but they weren't there when we actually did the the horse and the trophy. And and you know they know they're part of the team, but until you actually there, you feel the adrenaline, you hear the the cheers, uh, the camaraderie between your teammates coming back to the your trailer after winning. Uh, it was a special time, especially for them. Do you have any more competition set up for the rest of the year at this point? Well, uh, my bro my brother come in here today, Tracy, who runs the compound back here where we do all our classes. You know, we'd already said we didn't want to do the Royal and uh, because we've got so much going on. We're doing classes every month. Uh, I'm booking December right now because the other months are full. Wow. Uh, fix and probably pull it down and go into January 22. And uh, I told him, now nah, he's wanting to go do the Royal. He said, well, don't this get us an automatic into the invitation? I said, I don't know, Trace. I don't know what time the cutoff is. And uh, and I got him, but now get this. I bought him Black Crow tickets for him and his fiance back in 19. Yeah. The Black Crow coming back at Phillips Arena in Atlanta. And they had to reschedule. Didn't give them money back, reschedule. Well, it's the same weekend, I believe, as the the Royal. I said, you know, and I'm not going to go unless he can go. He said, can you get your money back and let's go to the Royal? I said, let me tell you something. I said, you go out, we do good in Memphis, and now you want to go cook every weekend. I said, we can't do that. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see if we make the Royal or not. He's, he's worrying the hell out of me about it. But uh, we all want to do more MBNs, Memphis Barbecue Network Contest. It's the only place you get to cook a hog anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got one over here close to us that is supposed to happen in America's Georgia, which is about 30 miles from me. And this the first weekend in June. So if that happens, we'll be there cooking that whole hog there. Uh, just for the folks that don't know, by the way, uh, world titles uh, come in 2021, obviously this past week in 2016, as you had mentioned, 2007, 2004, 2001. Also, let's not begrudge the fact that in 2020, 2016, 2007, 2004, 2003, and 2001, Myron was the world champion in hog as well. So six times a hog champ and five times a uh, world title that followed on the year they won the hog as well. So. Uh, certainly uh, a very accomplished Memphis and May resume, to say the least. Um, so as we kind of transition out of that and uh, bring up another part of the business, which is book writing, you've done a number of uh, really good books. The last time you were on the show, we kind of side mentioned that you were down 100 pounds at that point and you were um, right. you know, kind of realizing uh, the age and how you felt and you were just making some changes and then lo and behold... Uh, the cookbook season hits, and I see keto barbecue from Myron Mixon. So I'm wondering if if you started keto, you know, back in 2019, and it's a lifestyle that you've kept on going, or if you've just transitioned to that as you've kept that lifestyle. When I was talking to you last time, I'd already had this, and uh, I was keeping notes, making notes for the book, and uh, I went to my doctor August in 2018. Don't have any health problems. I mean, I, my blood pressure is like 112 over 72 a lot of times. No, I don't take any cholesterol medicine or none of that. But I weighed like 339 pounds. And um, the heaviest I got in that time period is like 345. 
And I went to the doc, and he told me, you really need to look at uh, getting some of that weight off of you, not because, he said for your health, too, I mean, as far as your heart and stuff. But your knees, your joints, you know, like your ankles, your hips, he said they love you for it. And a good friend of mine, Jay McGear, used to talk about a two-ton body on a one-ton chassis. Well, that's what I had, a two-ton body on a one-ton chassis. And I started on the – and he recommended keto, and I went to ask him questions about it. And he said, this is a diet you probably could do because it revolves a lot around protein, which is meat. And uh, I got on it, and in the first nine months, I lost 100 pounds. And I stayed on it, stuck to it. But it's a diet that I can sustain. I can do it. A lot of people get on diets. They can lose a lot of weight, you know, to start with. But is it sustainable? Is it something you're going to be able to make a lifestyle out of and stick to it? Because a lot of times you get on a diet, you'll lose the weight. Then you gain it all back plus some. And, uh, you know, I make a comment about it. And and I'm sure there's been a diet where you eat dried rice cakes and drink water for the rest of your life. Well, yeah, you're going to lose weight, but can you stick stick to it? And... uh, it wasn't hard for me to drop the carbs, quit doing that. And a lot of sweet desserts, which now you got the monk fruit extracts, the 100% pure ones that you can use to substitute sugar works out really well. But the keto diet was something that I could really make work for me and uh, may not be for everybody else, but I could take food that I like, barbecue food. And people get a misconception about barbecue always going to be this make you gain weight. Well, nine times out of 10, it's not the meat. It's always those barbecue sides, the loaded baked potato salad, the barbecue mac and cheese, the peach barbecue beans, you know, those type things what puts weight on you. Yeah. The the beer that goes along with the barbecue. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The beer. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, so that started hitting front porches last week, 511, I believe. So you can Buy it wherever you would get books anyway, Amazon or the like. Just go ahead and search for uh, Keto Barbecue and Myron Mixon, and you will find it quickly. Uh, Last thing that I want to ask you about here before I let you go, Myron, and I appreciate the time this evening as always. uh, Next Wednesday, we will be announcing live here on this show exclusively the 2021 Hall of Fame inductees. There's a current list of nine folks that made it through that uh, names process. Uh, Bill Arnold is on there again. Ollie Gates from Gates Barbecue. Meathead from AmazingRibs.com is on it for the third time in a row. John Marcus makes his second appearance. Ed Mitchell is the first-timer. Rodney Scott's a second-timer. Joe Traeger, Darren Worth, and Leanne Whippen. Uh, You know all those names, of course. I mean, if you're uh, any kind of student of the game, you know those names and who they are. But uh, And I'm not going to ask you who you voted for unless you want to tell me, which I doubt. When you peruse that list of nine, are there any names that stick out to you as folks that are just special to you or, or that have endeared themselves to you? Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of them on there that deserve uh, – everybody in there deserves it. Um, but I'm going to tell you somebody on there that – I'm not going to tell you I voted for him or, or anything like that, but one person on there was on uh that man has persevered through a lot and if you know anything about his backstory um he's had a lot of things going like all of us we have a lot of things going on in our life but he developed a sauce that uh has has uh i guess you could say over the competition world uh has really uh set his place out there and he never gave up and he gave you know he, he struggled through his uh life problems, sickness, and everything else. Again, no different than a lot of us. But uh, the things he's getting now in life, he, he deserves it. He deserves everything he's getting. Byron Mixon is your 2021 Memphis in May world champ and the team of Jack's Old South, of course. And you can get his new book, Keto Barbecue, wherever you find books. And we'll see how the Hall of Fame drops out here a week from Wednesday. Myron, really appreciate catching up with you again. Congratulations again on the big win, and we'll look for you again soon. Thank you, brother. You got it. There he is, Myron Mixon on the Barbecue Central Show. Great to get caught up with Myron. Lots of good stuff there. And 
Really appreciate that recount of the weekend, especially since it was missed last year. And who knew what was going to be going on here in 2021. But real glad that they were able to pull it off. And he's your winner. Tied with Chris Lilly and the gang over there at Big Bob Gibson's with five world championships apiece. And a six-time hog champ, if you were listening. All right, we got Bill Oakley in the green room, and we'll get to him here in just a second. Let me talk to you quickly about Cosmos Q, based out of Oklahoma. Cosmos has been providing both backyard and competition cooks world championship-level rubs, sauces, injections, soaks, and brines. They have exclusive wing dust that's also available right now. Best of all, everything they make here is made in the States with all-natural ingredients. They are continuing to break new grounds in rubs and seasonings and sauce and the injection world, but results not only proven on the competition trail year after year, but also in the backyard as well. More and more backyard warriors looking to amp up that barbecue game. No better or easier way to do that than by picking world championship quality rubs, sauces, injections, and marinades. And that's exactly what Cosmos Q brings to your table. It's not just barbecue. They have the grilling game covered as well. And Cosmos knows a little something about grilling. He's a world championship steak cook, for crying out loud, so you know you're going to get the good stuff. You want to save 10% on your order? Do this. Go to the website, Cosmos Q. That's Cosmos with a K, the letter Q.com. And as you check out, use promo code SPRINGBBQ10, all one word, SPRINGBBQ10, when you visit CosmosQ.com, and you can save 10% off your entire order. The wing dust. you got to try the wing dust magic. I like the salt and vinegar myself. But the buffalo one is really good too, especially if you run out of buffalo sauce. I don't know if people actually do that, but if you did, it's really good. All right, enough of that. Bill Oakley coming up next. We're going to talk about fast food reviewing and lampooning. Stick around. We'll be right back. Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. Welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. Visit CookinPellets.com for more information to view other products or to purchase you can also do it at Amazon.com as well. Central Lights, do you love fast food? I know many of you do. In fact, it's as popular as ever. So much so, there are people on the social media channels doing fast food reviews for a living. My next guest, killing it on the Instagrams right now. He's doing fast food reviews, and I'm happy to have him on the show tonight to talk a bit about his background and how he got into the review game. So we race to the hotline and welcome in first timer to the show, Bill Oakley. Hey, Bill. Hey, nice to be here. I am happy to have you here. Thanks for making time. And before we get into the food, fast food reviewing game or business or niche or whatever adjective we want to uh-huh. throw at it, uh, I'm excited to have you on because I'm interested, um, I'm interested in the Instagram stuff, of course, and how you got into it. And we can discuss some of those trendy topics of the day as it relates to the fast food industry. But let's do a quick check of Bill's background here so we can get a proper introduction for the folks that don't know you. And I think, as I was doing my own research, that we might have our very first Harvard-educated guest here on the show, if you can believe it. So can you give us a bit of a background on you professionally and uh, where you are home-based out of right now? Absolutely. I am a... uh I'm a TV comedy writer by profession. Uh, I have been writing TV comedy for many years. I was the head writer of The Simpsons back in the day, along with my partner, Josh Weinstein. We wrote a lot of episodes. We ran the show for a couple seasons. I also worked on Futurama, uh, Portlandia, Disenchantment. And now I'm the head writer of uh, Close Enough on HBO Max. And that's my actual paying job. This uh, fast food thing is merely my hobby. It doesn't pay any money so far. Uh, we've quickly uh, glossed over the fact that you went to Harvard for college, which I think, uh, you know, in many yeah. instances, it's like a um, a goal for some folks. Uh, when I was looking at college, like I was hoping to get into Ohio State, and 
you know, back in 92, I think that was everybody else's safety valve. I was just hoping they would say, yes, by the way, they said no, and I had to go to community college. But Harvard is a completely different animal, certainly the, one of the highest institutions there for um, higher learning. And also, um, I think the thing that appeals to me even more than that, you were part of the Harvard Lampoon, which has spawned like some of the very best comedy minds of generation after generation. So um, uh, I guess, A, were you always looking to get into Harvard? And what was it like uh, being in the Lampoon? Uh, I was not looking to get into Harvard. I, I actually wanted to go to Stanford, but I got rejected. Uh, but what happened was I, I kind of played my, I, uh, when I applied, I kind of hit my comedy credentials hard. Like I had written, Josh and I uh, had started a humor magazine in high school, which in retrospect was actually really good. It was basically the same quality as a college humor magazine, but it was just in high school. And I think that imp my grades were good, but it wasn't like I was world class or anything. I think I impressed them with my publications skills. And then I was set, I immediately wanted to get on the Lampoon. And fortunately, um, I was able to, because I was a cartoonist and they needed some cartoonists back in those days. And I was on there with Conan O'Brien. He got on, he had gotten on just, uh, he was a president when I got on. And then a number of other people who've gone on to TV writing, like uh, David X. Cohen, who created Futurama, Paul Sims, who uh, created News Radio, and uh, a number of other people that I worked with over the years who've been my college friends. We were all kind of there together. And Honestly, uh, that's what I spent all my time doing in college. I didn't. I, I attended the classes and I did acceptably, <laughs> but my I really majored in the lampoon. I pretty much from the moment I got on to the moment I graduated, I spent all my time there working on the magazine and our specials and our pranks and things like that. So was the goal at the end to be in a position where you could go pitch yourself to a TV show or start your own show or something along these lines or? Uh, to get noticed because it, like leveraging the lampoon name to get into show business in some way well in those days it was more like it, for magazines like we still had national lampoon national lampoon was founded by guys who graduated from the harvard lampoon and they paid us a licensing fee and back in those days national lampoon still existed and was still pretty good and so it was kind of like you want to get a job there but as it was on the decline a lot of people were starting to get jobs uh, at Letterman back in back when Letterman was still on NBC and things like that. And it became I, I never had thought of that as a career option. But then when I saw other people doing it, uh, Josh and I decided to give it a try. And we didn't have much success at, at first. It took us about four or five years to actually get our first decent job. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on about uh, TV and, and all these things. I love uh, the business of business and all this. Let me ask you one last question before we transition over into the food stuff. If you were doing what you were doing now, versus when you were doing it, given the way TV has changed and consumption of media has changed, do you think that your career would look different? I mean, taking out the shows and all that stuff, but do you think you could have had a similar career track or could it have been better if you were in the lampoon now getting ready to graduate? I don't know. It's a different kind of thing these days because back when I was on The Simpsons, there were still only really four TV networks and there were a couple, you know, there were some cable channels and it was a different universe uh, in terms of TV writing. Now there's a thousand shows and there's a hundred new ones coming out every day. And um, also they don't really, it's harder, much harder to build a career out of that these days because the shows are, um, they get, you know, they have six episode orders. You were only work for a couple weeks a year. It takes a lot of hustling. And I don't know if I would have been capable of it had I not slid into that lucky job at the Simpsons. <laughs> Uh, we're talking with Bill Oakley. You can find him on Instagram at that Bill Oakley. 30,000 of you plus are following him right now. Are you a live fire fan, eater, cooker, both? Yeah, by live fire, you mean barbecue, right? Yeah, barbecue that grilling. <laughs> That's like my term that I'm trying oh, yeah. to, to get generated yeah, yeah, yeah. in the industry. I, I do not. I wish somebody would give me a fancy smoker, but nobody has done it. And, and so I still have a, I have a pretty nice grill. And I grill stuff, you know, I grill uh, ribs and things like that, chicken, burgers, things like that. But I haven't really done any like hardcore barbecue type smoking stuff, which I would kind of like to get into. Um, when does fast food reviewing come at you? Is that just eating a burger one day <laughs> and you're like, I could talk about this? Or were you watching some other things and you wanted to try your hand at it? Well, I... I've always been very interested in fast food uh, because I didn't get it as a kid because I grew up uh, in the country and back when their McDonald's, nearest McDonald's was like 70 miles away. So you get to go once a year for your birthday. 
And so I was de- just like video games. I was also deprived of video games. And now that I've made up for that as well. So, but I think what happened is I was unduly fascinated by fast food, especially when new stuff would come out. I always want to try the new stuff and see, and, you know, see what kind of new inventions, new burgers they had and be like the first person to get it. So I used to just tell people about my opinions and then I started putting them on Twitter. And then one day, three years ago, I decided, hey, it's a lot easier just to film a video of yourself than it is to type all these tweets about your opinions. So, and I kind of just transitioned and started putting these videos up on Instagram and they got some attention right away, like from McDonald's and from the head chef of McDonald's. And they were like, hey, congratulations on your new career as a food blogger. And I was so delighted that I <laughs> kept on going. Um, so, and you know, that was 150 videos ago. From a, you telling us about why we should listen to you from a food review, uh, why do we want to follow you? What, what endears you to us if we're somebody that likes to get fast food reviews from folks? Well, first of all, I should say I didn't invent this genre. This genre. Of I course. mean, there's there's dozens of people doing it on YouTube <laughs> who've been doing it for years. Like uh, Dame Drops is the guy who invented it. Apparently, he's got over a million followers. I can't compete with people on YouTube, uh, like Report of the Week and Dame Drops, who have a million followers. I don't even do. I put my old reviews on YouTube to archive them, but I'm only on Instagram. So the thing about Instagram is it only allows 59 second videos. So my videos are short. And that's a selling big selling point for me is that in this like in these days, every time somebody's like, I want to show you a video and they queue it up and it's 15 minutes long. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> can we can we see the short version? And so on Instagram, my reviews are always 59 seconds long. Uh, and then I also post stuff on my story almost every day that is of, of not necessarily fast food. Sometimes it's local stuff here in Portland <clears throat> or people things that people mail me. I've been getting a huge amount of stuff mailed to me of all types, uh, liquor, oysters, um, Canadian potato chips, uh, Scandinavian licorice and stuff like that. And then I kind of, I don't necessarily review it on my story, but I also, but I talk about it and, and I show photos of it. And sometimes if I love it, um, I will include it in my end of the year awards show, which is my, my other claim to fame on this thing is my, the steamy awards, uh, which are named after the steamed hams sketch I wrote on the Simpsons. Uh, I have an award show and at the end of the year uh, with 10 categories for all the best things I ate. And then I get celebrities to give out the award as well. Nice. Um, so the platform makes sense. You want to keep it short. Instagram's 59 seconds. Um, you say you go to the stories. Um, now that you had mentioned that you're getting a lot of stuff that people are sending to you, is there a expectation that if somebody sends something to you, it's going to make it on your feed at some point? Or, uh, I mean, to me, uh, I just say you're going to have to pay me money before I would even think about it because I am fully ethical and capitalistic at the same time. How do you attack that being somebody that's gaining notoriety here and now people are just sending you stuff? Well, generally there's a difference between when people just civilians send me stuff, you know, like people in Canada say, you got to try my favorite potato chips. And I, I always post that stuff. Um, yeah, I show, you know, I don't necessarily say whether I like it or not unless I love it. But, uh, when companies send me stuff, it's a different matter. Um, you know, generally when it's a small local company or whatever, I, I show the thing and then I talk about it if I like it. If it's a big multinational corporation, I don't feel that obligation. I have I feel I feel that I need to be more honest about this, that stuff, because that's what people tune in for. Is this burger any good? Uh, and, and generally, the fast food companies, I think, are a little wary of me because I that's part of why I'm known as the Gordon Ramsay of fast food is because I'm brutally honest. Uh, and so uh, I. I, I tend to, people really do uh, tend to take my opinion seriously. Uh, so uh, about that kind of stuff, I, I am generally really honest. And like fast food companies generally don't send me stuff. They only send me stuff if I like the product after the fact. Bill Oakley joining me here on the show, and we're talking about his uh, background getting into this food review game. So uh, I'm not reading too much into this or anything. Uh, I assume that this is just fun. You'll continue to do it, and there's no real major end game coming along here or, or maybe you're creating a pilot TV show off of this as you know the main character is a uh, Instagram food reviewer I would, I, I would I don't want to write a scripted show about this but I would certainly be happy to go around being Guy Fieri type you know we're going to places and trying the food in fact I would love to have a show like that um, uh, you know about whatever regional pizza styles or something like that in America but um, I'm not really I'm not really working towards it um, I'm just kind of doing it for fun, uh, and and 
you know, bringing people along for the ride, I guess, at the moment. I wouldn't mind if it started to pay in some other way, but at the moment, um, I, I'm just enjoying just having fun doing it. All right, Bill. So enough of this bullshit. Let's get down to business here. You know, over the past few years, we have seen an explosion in the fast food realm concerning one item and one item alone, the chicken sando. One reserved solely for Chick-fil-A for any number of years has now seen an emergence of many other fast food chains bringing their offerings to the table. My first question to you is, in your expert opinion, of all things that could have knighted a border skirmish amongst these chains, why the chicken sandwich? I know the answer to this because I've been doing, I did a couple like podcast things with Mike Harris, who used to be the head chef at McDonald's All right. when this whole thing started. And for, according to Mike, it was basically everybody, it was when Chick-fil-A started to expand nationally. Chick-fil-A used to be a regional chain that was only in the South. And as it began to expand nationally, the fast food owners and operators got worried about them cutting in on this. And they demanded that a chicken sandwich be made. Uh, and sold. And I think the first out of the gate was Popeye's. Actually, if you recall that, that was almost two years ago now. And it, it still honestly is the is the best one. Uh, and I've ranked them all. Or I've ranked, you know, some of them, I can't get the regional ones like Zaxby's and stuff like that. Can we, but, can we um, not like uh, jump into that yet? Because I may have prepared a question for something. Oh, okay. Like sorry. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> right. Okay. Absolutely. So everybody's jumping in because, uh, Chick-fil-A because is Because they were expanding. afraid of Chick- That's right. Yeah, Chick-fil-A cutting in on their market share. And then when Popeye's started, they really panicked. And everybody started rolling theirs out, you know. And then just recently, I don't know. that I think Carl's Jr. is probably the last one. And they just launched theirs this week. Is that the mother clucker? Oh, no, wait. That's Carl's Jr., that's, um, that's rallies, I think. Hardee's. That's Hardee's yeah. in the East. Yeah. yeah. In 2019, as you had mentioned, uh, you know, there was a chicken sandwich war that was Chick-fil-A going against the upstart chicken sando of Popeye's that you had just talked about. Popeye's blew Chick-fil-A out of the water. Genius marketing, generating crazy demand from the general population and the, in my opinion, solely totally speculating. A well-played sandbagging of their chicken supply caused the fast world, uh, fast food world to almost spontaneously combust. So, uh, you know, self-proclaimed movie producers who appeared on the show back then sued Popeyes because, in a quote, Big Chicken needed to be taught a lesson. And uh, 2021, or had 2021 not introduced us to this global pandemic of coronavirus, do you think that 2020 would have taken that race even further with even more players in the game? I don't think it's possible for there to be any more players in the game. I mean, which, which place doesn't have a chicken sandwich now uh, and which place doesn't have a hand breaded one. Like it, it's also, there's the new generation of chicken sandwiches. Like we all know that Burger King had that chicken sandwich for the past 30 years. And so did McDonald's. It, it's these new ones that are basically copies of, of Chick-fil-A or Popeye's that are the new generation. Often they're called a hand breaded. Um, and so, yes, I, but I think that now literally like with, with Carl's Jr. and Hardee's this week introducing it, I, I can't think of a single place that doesn't have this, that's not playing this game. When I was watching the calendar year change from 19 to 20, I think one of our predictions, um, I have a, a, a round table of sorts at the end of every month with the embedded correspondence, as I affectionately refer to them. They're malfeasance, but uh, nevertheless, we thought, hey, Chicken Sandwich has been absolutely nuts in 2019. And as the year turns, we think that this thing is just going to take off. And then I thought with the coronavirus, there was a, a backing down of momentum. Now, honestly, I'm not a huge fast food guy per se. But for as much as I was hearing about it on the periphery of what I'm covering in 2019, it seemed to drop off rather quickly there in the beginning portions of 2020. So, A, is that a fair assessment? And then B, did it pick up again here over the last couple months, as you're talking about with uh, the last two probably entrants into the market? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it would have gone a lot faster had it not been for the pandemic, because from what I understand from Mike, uh, some of these places had to install new equipment in their restaurants to make this stuff. These hand breading stations like Burger King had to do it. And I assume Carl's Jr. did as well. And that, it, that requires re-architecting the kitchen and stuff. So yes, obviously, that, I think the pandemic slowed it down by six months or so, but now we're back into it. 
big time with Burger King and, and Carl's Jr. and a couple other ones just in the past months uh, launching theirs. But I think it's I have I'm actually ready for it to be over now because I want to go back to hamburgers, uh, which I vastly prefer to even the best chicken sandwiches. All right, so let's do it. Um, as you had mentioned, you are currently rating chicken sandwiches. Uh, I was going to place a wager of 32 of my most special dollars that you might have one, but I don't even need to wager <laughs> because you said you did. So uh, I assume it's ever evolving uh, with ones that you try, especially that are new compared against the one that you have tried. So uh, going from five to one, can you give us your ratings of current chicken sandos? I think I can. I have to just make sure I have the right number in my head. Okay. Uh, I'm counting here on my fingers. Okay. Tied for fifth place. Tied. KFC and Carl's Jr., uh, both of which are a B minus. Okay. Now, remember, I'm not doing regional chains like Zaxby's or Whataburger or whatever. We don't have those out here. Okay. Fourth, Chick fil A. They've been bested at their own original game. <laughs> uh, third, McDonald's, which really did this is the be- their their new chicken sandwich uh, is the best chicken sandwich they've ever had. Uh, it narrowly beats out the Southern style chicken sandwich, which was excellent from a few years ago. Second, much to everyone, especially my surprise, is Burger King, and this is because I haven't you know Burger King has not has often been the butt of my jokes because they've had such a horrendous selection of new items over the past few years. This is a shocker because it is so good. And this is what I found out again from Mike and from other people in the fast food business. This is because Popeye's and Burger King are owned by the same company now. So basically all the know-how that Popeye's had, including this hand breading station, which they had to install on these Burger Kings made their sandwich. It's almost identical to Popeye's except for a slightly different spice array on the spicy one. Uh, So, Yes, highly recommended. Best thing on the Burger King menu. Best thing they've introduced in 30 years or more. And then finally, uh, Popeye's, which one. I Sorry I spoiled that for everybody, but I think people probably knew it was coming anyway because Popeye's can't be beat. It's, it's the, the spi- And when I say sp- – I mean it's the spicy one. There's a, the, there's a slightly different ranking for the non-spicy one. The spicy one is the coin of the realm. Let me ask you this question. This was the most – in 2019, this was the most popular question I asked folks when – I was just doing the toss-away question at the end about have you had the Popeye's chicken sandwich. But Yes, of course, most of the people did. I said, rank it like this. So let me ask you this question, Bill. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the worst thing you have ever eaten in your life, 10 being the best thing you have ever eaten in your life, where does the Popeye's chicken sando rank? You know, for me, I would say a seven. Uh, I, I don't. I'm not. A, really? I don't go out seeking out chicken sandwiches. Like you know, like I've had so many. You're talking about in fast food. In the fast food. No, universe, I'm talking about the best no. food ever. Oh yeah, best food I ever. I would say it's a seven. It's, it's a not seven. In the top 100 best foods I've ever had. No. No. Why are you thinking it would be higher or lower? Uh, Bill, I'm telling you, I have had people on this show. Tell me that the Popeye's chicken sandwich, of all food taking into account, this is what I'm talking about, one being the worst and ten being the best of all food that you've ever had. People have told me that Popeye's chicken sandwich is a seven or an eight, if you can believe it. I find oh, that to well, be so preposterous. I'm right in agreement with them. I, I, I can't believe that. I mean, there have to a seven or an eight? Wait. You think that's too good or not good enough? That is incredibly generous, I think. For a fast food chicken sandwich, it's a fast food mm. chicken sandwich. Well, I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't have, I don't eat a lot of food that's, that's really fancy. <laughs> so, you know, this for me, this is, it's, it's, a, it's not something I would, I've had, I have four or five better chicken sandwiches within a, a, a 10 minute drive of here, you know, that are all like locally made. Um, also, I, there's 10 fast food hamburgers that I'd rather have, and there's a, 60 types of pizza I'd rather have. And so, like, and then we're not even talking about extremely nice food that that, that I don't usually have very much. But so, would yes, those I rank say, at like an eight or a nine? Then those other things that you're just talking about? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Mm-hmm. I'm just looking for perspective. For me, so would. the next yes. time we have you on, you know, this is going to be like the recurring question to Bill Oakley is. 
whatever product we're ending with that night is, you know, where does it rank on the Barbecue Central show of 1 to 10? So I'm just trying to get uh, yeah. no shade. I mean, everybody's palate. I always <laughs> say I learned from Gary Vaynerchuk many years ago when I was learning wine. Uh, trust your pal, as he would say, or trust your palate. If it tastes good to you, then screw everybody else. Uh, you eat what you like and you rate it where you rate it. And then it's always fun to just kind of talk about and uh, and go from there. So uh, uh, what's on the agenda here over the next number of weeks that we might be able to look forward to? Uh, in the fast food universe, uh, there's not that much happening other than this McDonald's BTS meal. And uh, the McDonald's meals are so, all these meals, they have like the Travis Scott meal. It's just like, you know, it's a Sprite. You get this, it's, they serve you a Sprite with your meal. They're, they're so, the BTS meal is, you know, the Korean K-pop oh, super yeah, group. Oh, BTS. BTS. I, it's going to do on a tour. And so this is the BTS meal. And the one thing that they're going to introduce that's different this time is two sauces that they have in South Korea that we don't have here. So there's something to look forward to there. That's the big piece of fast food news mm-hmm. this month. Um, there's another, a, a bit of, tri- there's other trivial news like Del Taco's attempt to take over the Mexican pizza thing that Taco Bell dropped, stuff like that. But honestly, that's um, on the horizon for the next month. That BTS thing is going to be all you're hearing about in the fast food universe. All right. So if you're into the fast food stuff, keep your eyes and ears open for BTS. Uh, in November, when it comes back out again, we'll talk about the McRib. And I'm sure we'll have spirited yeah. debate on that as well. In the good, meantime, good. you can go over to Instagram and follow Bill Oakley at that Bill Oakley. And uh, you can check him out online as well. Bill, really appreciate the time this evening and letting us get to know you a little bit better. Continued success. And we'll talk to you again soon. Hey, thanks very much. It was great to be here. You got it. There he is. Bill Oakley right there talking about the Popeye's chicken sandwich. Again, if you're just tuning in. Bill's rating, uh, five was a tie for KFC and Carl's Jr. Four was Chick-fil-A, as he said, getting bested at their own game. And fourth, I mean, how embarrassing for Chick-fil-A. Third is McDonald's. Uh, I did have a McDonald's hand-breaded, orig- hand-breaded uh, not spicy chicken sandwich yesterday by accident. And, uh, you know, it was about as not good as it gets. Uh, number two was BK and, or Burger King. And number one is Popeye's, to no surprise, of course. So uh, we thank Bill Oakley for coming on and uh, getting to know him. And that could be a a bit of a recurring segment if he's open to that. So looking forward to getting on with Bill Oakley through the rest of 2021. All right, we're a little late here. So let me get back on the clock. I'll quickly talk to you about Pits and Spits since 1983. They've been handcrafting smokers and grills in Houston, Texas. In that time, Pits and Spits has established itself as one of the premier brands in high-quality offset smokers and, of course, more recently, pellet cookers. Pits and Spits setting itself apart by using heavy 7 and 10 gauge stainless in every cooker, fully welded construction that you can feel when you use the unit, and a 304 stainless roll-top lid, and front shelf on every single smoker. So why does it matter? Well, by using higher quality materials, pit and spit smokers reach and maintain temperatures, allowing you to worry more about the meat than the heat. And by providing a fully welded smoker, you don't have to worry about the grease rolling out of the barrel or that grill rattling apart as you move it through the backyard. And you have an heirloom quality uh, piece of equipment to pass down to the kids. Now, where some people are focusing on low cost providership, pits and spits focuses on craftsmanship, And using quality materials, are there cheaper ways to make these? Yes. But Pits and Spits, not a fan of tack welds, cheap stainless, and electronics that you can't trust. Having in-house manufacturing gives them complete control of the design and standards, not something you find at other places. Their steel suppliers are bringing in materials to be used in some of the harshest environments around, so they can perform in any and all conditions, and their controllers are made right here in the States, giving them unimpeded transparency into the program. Pits and Spits has a dealer network across the country. If there's one close to you, call them in the shop. Ask Koi, what is right for you? 844-650-6250. Whether you're a backyard grill master looking to cook steaks for the family or a competition team looking to smoke 50 racks of ribs, Pits and Spits has a product for you. Check them out online. Pits and Spits, all spelled out. Or check them out in the wild across social media with our handle at Pits and Spits. Uh, we reset for the second hour, so let me do a quick transitiony thing that's going to seem really disjointed, and we'll get back on the clock and go from there. Stick around. We'll be right back. 
continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. And we thank Bill Oakley again for joining us last segment. This portion brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring. Or connect via Bluetooth. And if you have Alexa or the Google Assistant in your home, you're luck. Because Fireboard is fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting Fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. That's Fireboard 2, Fireboard 2 Drive, and Fireboard 2 Pro for you high heat maniacs. Okay, that was Bill Oakley. You can find him over on Instagram at that Bill Oakley. And before that, Myron Mixon came in and talked about Memphis and May. He also talked about his new barbecue keto book and did not give me his votes for Barbecue Hall of Fame that will be revealed next Wednesday. Shame. But I asked. All right, we are wrapping the first hour, heading to the second. It will be an abridged open, and then we'll get over to Susie Bullock from Hey Grill Hey. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show.